This is the Real Crusades History Podcast. My name is Jay Stephen Roberts. I'm going to be hosting today. And uh, we are wrapping up with this podcast our series on the Third Crusade. So we have gone through the entire history of the Third Crusade, and we have come to the end. Uh, the Treaty of September 1192, this was the agreement between Saladin and Richard which ended the Third Crusade. So we're going to explore that and explore the results of the Third Crusade. I'm very happy to have with me today uh, two uh, regulars who've been with us through this entire podcast series, or most of it. Uh, Dr. Helena Schroeder, author and historian. Dr. Schroeder, welcome. Thanks for being here. It's always a pleasure to be here. Excellent. And uh, also, we're very glad to have with us Dr. Stephen Donaghy, historian. Dr. Donaghy, uh, welcome. Glad to have you. Thank you very much for having me back. All right. Excellent. So uh, let's kind of uh, jump into the end of the Third Crusade here. So again, as, as we spoke about uh, in, the, in the last podcast, the final engagement of the Third Crusade was this Battle of Jaffa, in which Saladin kind of tried to uh, uh, take the upper hand again after sort of being uh, repeatedly beaten by Richard, and that didn't work out. Richard was able to... Uh, to win that battle. And so at, at this point, the two sides did come to an agreement. So essentially what this agreement was, uh, as I know we talked about this last time, Dr. Schroeder, it was a truce. It was a three-year truce. And the agreement was that Saladin would recognize these coastal conquests of, of the Crusaders, uh, stretching from Accra through Tyre and Jaffa, except it's not in that order. Uh, Tyre comes first. And at the same time, the Crusaders were required to give up Ascalon. Ascalon, which originally, uh, this had been why they had been unable to come to an agreement, because Richard wanted to keep Ascalon, but at this point, he finally gives in to that, and Ascalon is surrendered, although Richard does uh, uh, require that it be demolished. So there will be uh, no fortress there where there had been one. So, uh, Dr. Donaghy, since these are your notes that we, we are using today, I'd like to start off with you. Uh, would you like to kind of talk about the Treaty of Jaffa and uh, maybe some of its immediate effects uh, in the immediate aftermath of the Third Crusade? The Treaty of Jaffa, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a peace. I mean, it is, is a truce, and it's supposed to last for three years and three months beginning in the Easter of 1193, after which it, it, it's supposed to expire and uh, people can resume hostilities again. And three years and is, is not a, a long period of time when you think about it for, for them to recover um, and they, the coastal area is, is, is secured for the Franks there's acknowledgement by Saladin of, of Frankish possessions over the coast running from, from Tyre down to Jaffa which is it's about 90 miles or so in length so he's got a strip of, of territory along the coast that's 90 miles in length and only a, a few miles wide at, at most um, and Ascalon which is sort of the, you know the the big issue, and we've talked about it quite a lot in the previous podcast. Obviously, this important location um, for ships and uh, for, for for raiding and uh, access to Egypt and, and Syria um, is demolished. And Richard initially wanted to maintain it and and give it to to the Franks, but there's some reluctance on their part to take hold of it. Maybe they don't think that they can hold it successfully or it's going to be the the one sticking issue that even if they do hold it, Saladin will not accept that it can remain in their possession too long. It's too much of an important location to, to, and a threat to the Ayyubid Empire at this time. So this, this um, treaty, this temporary treaty, comes out of this um, and the sides of the draw. Uh, people, the, the Crusaders are permitted to visit Jerusalem. And certainly from an individual perspective, people who've been fighting for years, these Crusaders who've come from Western Europe, get to go to Jerusalem, pray at the sepulchre, visit the holy city. And for them, that must be, you know, uh, quite an important motivational factor, quite an important psychological effect, you know, that they finally got to the, ho the, the, the holy city, even if it remains outside of their control. All right. Uh, that's an excellent start there. Uh, Saladin's army, I know Baha Adin d does mention in his source that this was a, an incredibly uh, joyous occasion for, for the Muslim army. They were really glad to to have uh, an, an end to these hostilities. But he says that Saladin himself uh, didn't want this peace because, um, you know, he, he was leaving the, the Crusaders with some considerable advantages and that they had conquered uh, this these important territories along the coast. So 
Well, he had vowed to t throw them into the sea. I mean, we have the same situation right. as, as the Arabs now against Israel, where it, the only victory that's the real victory is the end of, of the Crusader kingdom. So he has, by accepting, which is why it's only a truce, he's not accepting that. He is still determined to throw them into the sea and eliminate the Christian present in the Levant. Right. So uh, jumping back to some of your points up here, uh, Dr. Donaghy, what do you think were the ultimate goals for each side? Like you say here, what uh, were there future crusades in the works? What What's uh, Saladin's projection for long term? What do you think the two sides are thinking at this point? I'm thinking, I mean, Saladin has, in his entire career throughout the sort of 1160s, 1170s, and 1180s, has fought the, the Franks, the Kingdom of Jerusalem, gone to war with them, raided, had conflict, and then has made a treaty. And several years have elapsed, it, it, the treaty expires or is broken, and a conflict resumes. And I think he's just intending the same, the same thing as before. They fought, they fought each other to a relative standstill over five years, it's got to be a break. Um, a treaty time to rest, time to rearm, and then maybe in a few years' time, the onslaught will begin again. And the Kingdom of Jerusalem is very small. It's 20% of its former size now, it's this thin mm -hmm. strip along the coast, um, that he hopes that in the future, in a few years, when he's had time to rest and recuperate, that he can roll up the coast and finish the job um, once again. On Richard's terms, I mean, it's Jerusalem remains outside of Frankish control, outside of Christian hands. Um, that's not going to be acceptable in the long term to the West, to, to the papacy, to, the, uh, to his co-religionists back in Western Europe. There's going to be another crusade at some point, which Richard may very well want again to bring back. I mean, he's left his nephew, Henry of Champagne, in, in charge. And from what I recall of the sources, Henry certainly expects that Richard or something will be returning, um, that there will be another round of fighting and that he's holding the position, he's holding the, the foothold um, that they've got in the Latin East until the treaty expires. So I certainly expect on all sides that they expected that there would be more occurring. And certainly in, in 1197, 1198, the German Emperor, Henry VI, um, actually is organizing a crusade and turns up at the expiration of this treaty mm -hmm. with another crusade. Of course, he dies inconveniently in, in Italy before he, the entire army sets out. So only the vanguard of the army arrives. But there's clearly that sort of intention that, that something would occur in three, in three to four years' time to finish the job. Yes. Uh, and Dr. Schroeder, what do you think? I absolutely agree entirely. They say this is solid and consistently done this, made tru truce, truces, and then resumed it. He has a clear ideological intention of destroying the Christian present in the Levant. And Richard, I mean, it's harder to judge his motives, but he seems quite sincere. And I think there actually is some quote. Now, I'm, I'm forgetting exactly the source that he promises uh, Henri of Champagne that he will come back. Um, I think I think there's, and well, as you say, regardless of whether Richard would come back or not, other powers in the West, as we see, there follow. This was the third crusade. There we count up to eight, so five more actually follow. Yeah, so or, or, or nine maybe even we mm. could say, uh, depending. Yeah, exactly how you <laughs> count. <laughs> I recall, I think it's a quote from Malcolm Barber in his book on the Templars, I think. It was, uh, the Third Crusade is, is an exercise in, in damage and limitation. And it's done that. The damage has been limited, but it's not been finished. And a, a, at some point, to go back to the sort of boxing analogy, the next round's going to begin. Yeah, uh, that's kind of interesting. And, and we're, as, I, as I go down your notes here, uh, Dr. Donaghy, we come to this issue of Cyprus. I think Cyprus brings up an interesting por point because Cyprus had never been a part of the Crusader states up until this point. And in fact, when Richard arrives in the Holy Land, I mean, the kingdom of Jerusalem is essentially gone. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's all gone. Uh, so really, what's going on with, on with the Third Crusade, it's very different than the situation of, say, the Second Crusade. Uh, Richard almost had to start over. So I almost get this, this feeling that he had to almost create this new... Outremer, in a certain sense, um, and it's it's very different than the than what we had before, where, where you know there were these inland castles, you know, as far as Mont Real and these different areas. Uh, now now you've got this coastal territory, and then you've got Cyprus, um, and I think that addition of Cyprus, um, it really is is one of the keys to to making Outremer um, more viable. So let me start this time with uh, you, uh, Dr. Donaghy. What do you think about Cyprus, the addition of Cyprus? How did this impact uh, the Crusader states? 
the the the, the capture of Cyprus in 1191 and then its retention by the Lusignans is of considerable immense importance. Uh, you know, in the creation of this, or we might term a fifth Crusader state. Um, it's incredibly important. It's it's it all, it had been there consistently, sort of on the periphery of of the Frankish experience in in the Latin East. Um, it'd been there since the First Crusade, where supplies had been brought in from 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 Byzantine Cyprus. Um, Reynolds Chatillon raided it in the 1150s, and Richard captures it in 1191. And it goes into it ends up in the hands of Guy de Lusignan uh, after uh, sort of 1192, and it's now brought fully into that kind of perspective, into that world. And the thing is about Cyprus, it's an island, it's, it's a bastion. There's no internal or external frontier that has to be guarded and patrolled mm. or fortifications have to be used extensively to, uh, to secure it in the same way as in the mainland on, uh, in the Latin East. Um, and because Christian shipping by the, through the Italian uh, mercantile communities, Venice, Genoa, Pisa, is so incredibly powerful, so immensely dominant of, of, of the region, and Saladin's own navy um, has been worn down and is not a meaningful factor um, in, in the region anymore, especially since Ascalon and other such places are no longer under anyone's control, um, Cyprus is, a relatively, is relatively safe um, because it's at the maximum extent of, of, of ships' uh, operating ranges from, from Egypt. Um, so it's 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 much safer. There are native Christians there, Greek and Orthodox Armenian things, but nevertheless there is a much more in, uh, larger Christian uh, community for the Franks to take over effectively um, as they take control of the island. And it's incredibly wealthy and has abundant natural resources that can provide incomes for all of the dispossessed and refugee uh, members of society uh, of the Frankish society that have been displaced as a result of this conflict uh, that's ha- gone on since Hattin and when Guy takes over the island he offers out fiefs uh, to, to knights and uh, sergeants and, and turkopoles and uh, brings in sort of uh, Frankish burgesses from the mainland and from the crusading army to settle the island and, and take over. Um, it's a safe bastion offshore which will continue because it has the shared um, baronage between the, between between them um, will sort of sort of support and like 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 an IV drip or something like that um, the the Crusader states on the mainland. Good points. Uh, what do you think, Dr. Schroeder, about Cyprus? Well, I'd summarize it into three major points. The value of Cyprus is that it became the breadbasket of the Holy Land, replacing the lost inland territories, because it was actually, as I say, very fertile and had uh, sufficient resources to be able to... Per- because the, the coastal, we were talking about that narrow strip, did not, no longer had lost the capacity to feed themselves. The Holy Land was now mm-hmm. henceforth dependent on imports of food, and Cyprus was by far the closest and most reliable source, therefore, of um, food, as I said, so the breadbasket of the Holy Land. As uh, Dr. Donick has already hinted at, it protected the sea lanes. Um, it, if you look at it, if you look at a map, it really does, it thrusts itself right out there towards the Holy Land, and f- a fleet based in Cyprus could interdict anything trying to come up from Egypt or from anywhere else. So it was a like it was like an aircraft carrier. It was a forward base for Western shipping and was able to interdict any attempts to attack the Holy Land from Egypt. And it was a staging ground for future operations because Crusaders could assemble, as they did, on Cyprus, recover from the sea voyage. Particularly, their horses had a chance to recover before actually launching an attack on Muslim-held territories. Um, so it was it was vital. In fact, I would say that the two key accomplishments of the of the entire Third Crusade were first the con- conquest of Cyprus, and secondly the reestablishment, as we say, of the Christian control along the coast of the Levant, which allowed it to survive another hundred years. Right, and uh, the Third Crusade kind of as one of your statements in in here, Dr. Donaghy, is that it sort of looms large over the the coming century. Uh, the results of the Third Crusade sort of determine the course of uh, crusading in the Holy Land in the 13th century. So one of those issues is Egypt. Uh, Egypt is going to become the big target for future crusades. Obviously, the Fourth Crusade, which you know never gets there, the Fifth Crusade, the Seventh Crusade. So um, let me just uh, start with you here, Dr. Schroeder. Uh, what do you think the impact was on the Muslim world? I mean, I, I know that Aaron Kreutz, uh, as you said, he kind of takes takes up this position. 
of uh, from an Egyptian perspective. He actually uh, talks about the Third Crusade as having these long-term negative consequences for Egypt because Egypt is going to be the target of Frankish aggress aggression uh, quite a bit in the 13th century. So uh, what would you say are, are kind of the impacts on the Muslim world, on the Ayyubids, Saladin's dynasty? Uh, how does the Third Crusade sort of impact that? Well, we ultimately, it's the death of Saladin that which results in the the, dis, uh, um, the kingdom becoming weakened. I mean, Saladin's heirs fight among themselves. His brother finally takes over from his son. That weakens the dynasty. Was that a result of the Third Crusade? I don't think so. Ultimately, whenever a Muslim ruler dies, there tends to be a power struggle because there's no clear primogeniture and there's no clear succession there. Um, and also he had, as we've talked about in many of these sessions, a very diverse uh, empire with a lot of competing elements in it. So it was almost inevitable, but no matter how, what the outcome of the Third Crusade had been, I think that was going to happen. The fact that uh, future crusades focused more on attacking Egypt, we have to remember that in the 60s, King Almoric had also attacked Egypt. So the idea mm -hmm. of attacking Egypt wasn't entirely a new idea that comes out of the Third Crusade. So mm -hmm. the only thing we can talk about is that having, however, having Cyprus may, did make it easier to attack uh, Egypt. It, it was easier to stage forces there. They didn't have to all funnel down the coast to attack Egypt. They could, you know, sail directly from Limassol across to Demeter, which is what they consistently did. Right. What do you think, Dr. Donaghy? I mean, as pointed out, the importance of Egypt as as, as a centre um, and power base had been well noted since the 1160s and 1170s. And I think what the Third Crusade does is is it highlights to the Western European minds um, more more clearly the importance of Egypt as a target for future crusading. That Egypt is much more. Um, more, much, much more solidified and much more uh, compact than than the than Syria is by comparison, where there are differences between the rulers of Aleppo and the rulers of Damascus and things like that. That Egypt is a much more important target than Syria itself. Um, this becomes much more important in, in their minds and for future crusade planning, where from the wealth and control uh, of Egypt being channeled into. Uh, it, it, in, into the region as, as the threat against continued Frankish uh, presence in the area. And the third crusade, I mean, Saladin dies in March of 1193, age 55, and his empire begins to fragment amongst his his sons, who, who obviously are fighting over, and his brother, who will eventually succeed by the early 13th century. And I don't think obviously we should discount the 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 the, the role of of, of this long drawn out conflict that's had on, on his to had taken a toll on his health and his well-being um, at this time. But the death of Saladin is ultimately one of the key events that happens just after the Third Crusade that sets the tone uh, thereafter as well. Mm -hmm. How much of that can be connected directly to the Third Crusade, obviously, you know, sort of forensic, you know, is, is, <laughs> is, is hard to say. But I am sure there's obviously some connection between um, Saladin's health and the years of conflict that he's just undergone. Sure. So now let's switch over to the Western world, the Latin world. The Third Crusade obviously had a major, uh, probably you know, psychological impact even more so than anything on, on the West. Um, you know, when we get to the end of the the reg, um, the Gesta Regis Ricardi, uh, the author of that uh, Latin primary source for the Third Crusade. Uh, one of the points he actually brings up is kind of this issue that ever since then has kind of been a. A point of debate about the Third Crusade, and that is, uh, uh, what did it did it achieve? Did it did it not achieve enough? Um, was it a failure? Was it a success? And uh, he says how you know there are people back in Europe saying, oh well, you know they didn't really achieve anything because they didn't take Jerusalem. But he's saying no, no, you know we we were there. We took Acre. We took uh, you know we we won battles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. How does that sort of impact the Western world? Uh, I'll start with you on that, Dr. Donaghy. Um, especially this issue of Jerusalem, uh, the fact that Jerusalem is, is not re retaken. The thing is, is that hindsight's brilliant, isn't it? I mean, 
fortunately for us as as historians 800 years removed from the events we can obviously discuss you know oh it's really important that cyprus is taken and that the coast is secured and we have all of this you know convenient this perfect 2020 hindsight vision on and can discuss it but i could to the people at the time to to the western europeans who are seeing well what have you done what have you achieved to them, it must have seemed absolutely disastrous. Jerusalem remains outside of Christian control. The Latin East is still imperiled. Um, it must have seemed like an like an abject failure to them. That you know, and obviously the people who remain behind, convenience of armchair generals, of easy to criticise um, the perceived failures at the time, because Jerusalem remains outside of their control and because it's so incredibly important and central to the entire cosmology and worldview of of, of Western Christianity. Um, Crusading is going to have to keep going. I mean, unlike, say, the Second Crusade, where Edessa is not covered, but um, there's no, it doesn't have the same resonance as, say, Jerusalem does. And there's no, that unlike the Second Crusade, there's no this sort of, you know, this um, uh, this malaise that sets in. And um, like I was saying, it, the Third Crusade in was sparks a greater movement of crusading because now there's Jerusalem is once again outside of Christian control and there's something to fight for there's something as an actual direct goal Jerusalem has to be returned and this launches into this the height of the crusading uh, period in the in the early into the 13th century um, we can talk about what ifs if if Jerusalem had been taken how might that have changed things but because it isn't because it remains lost there's a goal to, as an actual motivating goal an actual single factor to strive for once again good points uh, dr. Schroeder what do you think Nothing to add to that. <laughs> Nothing whatsoever? <laughs> no, <laughs> that's okay. fine. Good, good stuff. So I guess uh, we kind of are coming to our final point on this, and that is uh, the legacy of the Third Crusade. Um, the Third Crusade kind of, again, it, it looms large in, in Western history. Uh, like the First Crusade, it kind of inspires uh, a lot of poetry and uh, you know, celebratory writing about it. Uh, the Second Crusade was was sort of underdocumented because it was such a disaster. But because the Third Crusade did have this, you know, this leader Richard the Lionheart, who who did uh, have these victories and whatnot, it does become kind of this this legendary thing in in Western Europe. And so, and Richard the Lionheart kind of becomes a figure, much like someone like Godfrey of Bouillon or Bohemond from the from the uh, First Crusade. He kind of becomes this iconic figure. So I want to talk a little bit about Richard and Saladin in terms of uh, their impacts on uh, their respective cultures and the opposing cultures as well. I mean, because both of these figures become sort of important to both sides of this war in the Third Crusade. Uh, Richard and Saladin are both remembered in, in Western Europe, and uh, the same is true for the Islamic world. Although I do get this sense from, uh, you know, researching this for so many years that Saladin kind of what well, was he sort of forgotten in some ways by the by the Muslim world for a long time and was sort of revived by by Western interest much later. So, Dr. Schroeder, since uh, since you uh, had nothing to add to the last one, I'm going to go ahead and jump straight <laughs> to you. <laughs> okay. And, and well, ask you what you what what do you think about this? Uh, how do Richard and Saladin impact uh, European and Islamic civilization? Oh, that's too. That's much too broad a question. But I will that's defer true. It's too broad. <laughs> To John France and his excellent, excellent book on uh, great battles, Hattin, because it, the book's very is misnamed because he really did, the battle he only takes up like fifteen pages of the whole book. He mostly talks about, how, of course, about the the build up to it. But I found the most fascinating uh, chapter was the last chapter where he looks at the impact, you know, right up until today. And the point he makes, of course, is that Saladin quickly becomes romanticized in Western literature. I mean, quickly, within 100 years, he's, being a, he's a secret Christian. His mother was a Christian. <laughs> There's all sorts of legends. And, and, the point, and he points out a lot of this had to do with you want to have a worthy adversary. And he was knighted at some point. There's all these incredible legends about Saladin. And it just grows and grows and grows into till you get, you know, the, the Stanley Lane pool kind of stuff where he was the epitome of chivalry against the, the crude, crude and brutal Richard and, and Saladin was the true Christian. He just happened to be Muslim. And, it, you know, this, this incredible fantasy world that's built around Saladin. Uh, you have, of course, paintings of Richard and Saladin jousting with each other, although they never met. You have, you know, 
Sir Walter Scott writing books, where, as I say, where Richard's sort of a dud, a, a, an idiot, but, but Saladin's this wonderful, brilliant, classical genius, you know. And <laughs> that, you know, and, 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 and chivalrous, he loves the late. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, he only had, I don't know how many wives and concubines and 17 sons, but oh, no, no, He's a, he courts the lovely, you know, uh, <laughs> Western ladies like the perfect gentleman and the perfect chivalrous knight. And it's, it's so much... Um, so much crap out there. I don't know how else to say it politely. <laughs> Maybe you can, you, can, you can fix up this. But it really, really is quite nauseating at times, which is why I like a book like Aaron Kreutz's, which just looks at him as a real uh, person of his age. Um, but in any case, that, that's what's happening in the West. Um, and Richard goes through it actually the reverse, whereas Richard at the time of his, when he was alive, was very much considered a paragon of... of of a Christian monarch, um, he's by the time you get you know the Reformation, then the, then Crusades are are considered stupid and bad, or first of all they're just considered Catholics, so we don't like them, and then by the time you get into the 19th century, they're considered bad and stupid, and and not rational and not economic, and and every, every with every century Richard's reputation declines, whereas Saladin's increases. So that's what's happening in the West, and in the the Arab world, I don't pretend to know everything. Um, as I say, based largely on what John France writes in Hatin, it seems that um, Saladin was considered, he basically failed. He died without having recaptured the entire, you know, coast. He takes another hundred years for them to finally get rid of the Christians. He's got the added disadvantage of being a Kurd. You know, his empire eventually falls apart. You know, he, he basically falls into... Uh, for, for as well, I'm not going to say forgotten. He's, he's ne- forgotten. Yeah, he, yeah. he basically, basically is forgotten and, and neglected more or less by the history for a long time, until you start getting after the um, imposition much, much of much later, much later. And yeah. of course, you have you know, Kaiser Wilhelm II going to Damascus and finding his tomb sort of dusty and in a corner somewhere, and nobody's paying much attention to it. But with the 19th century imperialism in the Middle East, he starts to become a symbol of our glorious past, and here was somebody who could defeat the Westerners, and so he starts to become admired. And uh, because that France lists all the people who then, you know, Saddam Hussein, who has a statue of himself dressed in the, in, like Hot Saladin, the Egyptians taking up, um, Nasser taking the, the eagle of Saladin for the flag, it goes on and on into the point where even ISIS claims him now, you know, so sure. as a great as a great Muslim hero who opposed the Christians and threw them out of the holy of the Holy Land or our Holy Land out of the Levant. <laughs> yeah, uh, excellent points there, Dr. Schroeder, for a, a question that's impossible to answer. Uh, <laughs> what do you think, Dr. Donaghy? What you have is is the creation of two characters uh, who have legends built about themselves because of their actions at this time. In the Third Crusade, Hattie in the Third Crusade, it's the one everybody knows. It's the it's the crusade that has the popular, you know, uh, knowledge, popular feel. Everyone's heard of Richard the Lionheart, and they might not necessarily remember Saladin, but they've definitely heard of Richard the Lionheart. He's the one person crusader that people can just generically name, and you get. Two different characters appear, and these aren't these aren't real characters. Obviously, there's a historical richer than there's a historical Saladin, but their legends grow to create these idealized literary characters who can be adopted and used and, and brought for for whatever to bear on any purpose that you want. Um, so you can you can take them up as a, as a champion as a hero to, to you know to, to promote your cause, which has regularly happened for one reason or another. More so with Saladin than it has with Richard, and. With Saladin, you, you we get two traditions developing: one in the one in the East and in the Muslim world, and one in the West. And as, as Dr. Schroeder points out, um, he is adopted in culture, and this creates a Western tradition of the magnanimous and honourable and virtuous Saladin that goes away through. So, within a century and a half, you've got quite famously Dante Alighieri places Saladin in limbo in the Divine Comedy, <laughs> and you know it, it's a very prominent position that you know he's uh, as as a, as a non-Christian um, and the only Muslim to appear in that way, and this goes all the way up, all the way through to the 20th century with this romanticised figure, and you get the sort of Stanley Lane Paul, the Prince of Chivalry, um, figure of the magnanimous and wonderful Saladin, but that is a literary creation that comes out of the actual source material 
of the period immediately after the Third Crusade. He's, that is an invention that we in the West, are, that the medieval chronicles at the time, create. Um, mm. And so that creates a, a completely separate and different Saladin to the actual historical Saladin. And at the same time in the East, you have, he's, he's, he is in some regards largely forgotten. He's there, he's in the background, there are stories told, but he doesn't occupy as prominent a place in popular thought in the same way as he does in the Latin West, which is almost kind of strange and, you know, this kind of reverse of, 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 of popularity. Because ultimately he doesn't succeed. Um, he has this victory at Hattin, but because the Third Crusade has some success in clawing back territory and because the height of crusading doesn't come until after his death, that he's put to the side. And people like, uh, like Baybars in, in the later 13th century, the Mamluks, who finally finish the job and expel the Europeans from the Levant, um, occupy a much more central place because of their relative of success. And Saladin is largely neglected for, for much of the period. And it comes up again in the 19th century with the rise of sort of uh, anti-European imperialism and uh, Arab nationalism that Saladin is taken up as a champion once again. So Saladin's popularity is much, in the, in the Arab world, is, is, is much more recent than, than it was. And he's taken up and again, he's used this, this romantic figure, this, this character of what Saladin is and champion by various things. And obviously quite famously the whole Saddam Hussein thing because they're both... <laughs> But from from Tikrit, and you think that Saladin has occurred, and the, the sheer, you know, contradiction between Saddam Hussein gassing Kurds and things like that, you know, but they, but he could then, you know, he's not taking up the real Saladin; he's taking up the idea of Saladin. He's a champion for whatever purpose he wanted to be, and Richard has a similar thing. He's considered to be a very good king at the time, but as time goes, because uh, he's he's outshone by others that follow, um, and is in again largely falls away until sort of 19th century where he's taken up as a as a national hero and is adopted into legends and customs and things like that and but you still have a lot of criticism i think it's the bishop stubbs is, is a bad son bad king bad crusader and it's still you know it's only recently with people like john gillingham who've really tried to reinvent and uh, the image of of richard but once yeah. again he we have a, a literary sort of uh, character that isn't necessarily the same as the real historical character that has come down to us through popular perception. Very good points, guys. So I guess as we kind of get to the end here, uh, Dr. Donaghy, one of the things we've kind of hit on throughout this podcast is that, um, well, one of your major areas of study has been 13th century Outremer, so sort of the... Mm -hmm the Crusader states as they were in the wake of the Third Crusade. So I want to kind of ask you about that. Um, what kind of society did the Third Crusade leave behind? What was Outremer like uh, at this point uh, going into the 13th century versus what, had, what it had been like before, if that's not too broad of a mm. question? I don't think that any medieval society, and certainly the, the, the Latin East, can undergo such a cataclysmic um, a series of events. The near total annihilation of their society in a short period of time and uh, the maelstrom of, of war and conflict for years that followed thereafter to re-establish it um, in a truncated and... Uh, massively reduced form without being fundamentally changed and affected by that process. And I think that in some regards that there is a different kingdom of Jerusalem. I mean, so we call it the kingdom of Acre sometimes um, mm -hmm. that exists after this period of 1187, 1192 that has been affected and has been changed by that process than existed in the century before it. And that we have a second kingdom of Jerusalem that has a different outlook that is in some... And, in many regards, it is still very much the same entity. There are very uh, things have changed, but you know they keep some of the same institutions. But the sheer fundamental change and the effect on it, I think, has had a mass has has changed it at its very core. I think the kingdom after sort of 1192 and into the the 13th century is a different beast, and its outlook, its strategies, its ideas, and are all different. It it doesn't take as strong a military line as perhaps it once did. There are no repeats of Amalric's invasions of Egypt as a unilateral action. Once mm -hmm. bitten, tr twice shy, effectively, um, that they're much more cautious because they don't have the territory to play with anymore. They're, they're pinned to the coast and they have to hold on with, with tooth and claw. So they don't want to risk another Hattin. So thus they have to wait more frequently for, for crusades where they have numerical strength and superiority and uh, Western assistance to make substantial gains back. Um, and they're also, uh, I think they're 
lots and lots of other changes. The, the reduction of the kingdom, its reduced geography, the acquisition of Cyprus changes the nature of its society, the nature of its economy, um, the nature of its geography, um, the nature of its diplomacy to, to reflect its new circumstances. And so that by the time you get into the later 13th century, it's a different kingdom. Yeah, and it's it's uh, pretty different in the early 13th century versus the the late 13th century. It kind of seems to go mm. through this period of recovery, where a, sub- a substantial, I mean, there's territory added to uh, to the kingdom mm. of Acre after the Third Crusade, isn't there? Yeah, you get Beirut and, and Sidon sort of fall back into greater... Beirut's captured in 1197, 1198. Sidon comes under more of Frankish control. Um, 12, um, 29 famously, the Sixth Crusade, Frederick II returns Jerusalem and various other areas. In 1240s, again, more, more territory is, is reacquired. And by the 1240s, the kingdom has recovered substantially and controls a large amount of territory once more. Still smaller than it originally was, but it has bigger than it was in 1192. And then in 1244, you have the Battle of La Forbie, and once again, there's mm-hmm. a defeat of the field army of the Kingdom of Jerusalem and a subsequent conquest of considerable chunks of the kingdom's territory um, within a couple of generations. And then 50 years later, the kingdom has fallen once more. Um, mm-hmm. So you have this recovery, and then it, it kind of happens again. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, Dr. Schroeder, I want to have you jump in on that. What do you think yeah. about this post what? You probably know that I'm an economist, so I have to point out that I think one of the major changes um, that we've talked about repeatedly, but now from an economic point of perspective, is they've lost the ability to feed themselves. The one hand, they have now Cyprus, so they're not entirely starving, but the focus of the economy becomes uh, much more producing export goods. Sugar uh, was a key export, oil, wine, and things that they can export to the West particularly, or to, the, to their neighbors in the east. And the economy becomes significantly more urban because they've lost the rural areas. They don't have the big baronies with the big, uh, you know, rural economy anymore. You don't have large numbers of peasants. What you have is an economy that's very, very urban, much more similar to the um, Italian city-states, where the, the people are making their living from trade, more than from agriculture, and their trade and craftsmanship. You have centers of glass making, you have pottery making, you have silver, etc. Um, you have a, a school of illumination, books in Accra. And that's a very, very different character um, from a traditional feudal society. Even the nobility in the second kingdom of Accra often have money fiefs. They started to have money mm-hmm. fiefs in the first kingdom of Jerusalem, but they're much more common in the second kingdom of Jerusalem. So you have, on the one hand, in Cyprus, you still have large baronies that are rural and traditional feudal structures, which enables, the, of course, the entire constitution to remain feudal. But in the kingdom of Jerusalem itself, on, in the, on, the, on the mainland, if you like, the, most of those fiefs are, in fact, money fiefs, and they're based on trade or taxes, um, excise duties, or whatever. That's an important thing. The, another thing that's really, really hap- that's very critical and very different about the Second Kingdom of Jerusalem is that with the loss of the large baronies, the loss of baronies, what the thing that a baron brings to a kingdom is his ability to field troops. So mm-hmm. that if a baron controls land, he has peasants and he has a town, and when he when he, you call up the feudal army, they are required to bring X number of knights and X number of turcopoles and X number of infantrymen as sergeants. And you, as I say, this beautiful um, John de Evelyn has, you know, really puts it all down in, about, you know, how uh, Ultra Jordan had 60 and Caesarea had 100 knights and, you know, Evelyn itself only had 10, etc. That's not there after the, the fall uh, in the Second Kingdom of Jerusalem. The barons of Cyprus may ha- be able to do that, but the barons of the kingdom of Jerusalem themselves are not capable of fielding troops. So the defense of the kingdom de facto falls to the uh, militant orders who can recruit troops in the west where they have these vast, vast empires of, of landed territory and where westerners are still you know, devoutly joining the orders and taking vows to go and fight for the Holy Land. So that the, the, the militant orders, the balance of power shifts away from the baronage and to the militant orders in the Second Kingdom of Jerusalem. So I think those are, those are two really, really important factors. Yeah. In, in addition, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just go to that. In addition, sure. um, you, because you've lost the majority of the internal area of the kingdom in which the majority of the royal domain 
it's locate what what was located, and you've only got a handful of, of cities along along the coast, rich and prosperous they might be through through trade uh, and and industrial production, is that whoever controls these cities is suddenly elevated in considerable importance within the new social political structure of the posts. Third Crusade Kingdom. So you have Tyre and Acre as the two most important and largest cities that expand considerably in the early 13th century, which remain under royal control initially, which is obviously a big feather in the cap for the King of Jerusalem. But places like Beirut and Caesarea and Sidon, which fall remain in, in baronial hands or fall into baronial hands, um, substantially make the, the, their, their lords considerably more important and you have this previously in the 12th century kingdom you wanted a strong monarchy that had could overpower that could be you could call upon more troops individually than its nearest of rivals and while collectively the baronage might be able to oppose the crown in smaller numbers it, it would not be as easy now that kind of that gap between the crown and its most important and most powerful vassals has been significantly reduced so barons, individual barons like the Ebelins, who obviously go on to become incredibly important in the 13th century under John de Ebelin, who's all this godfather-like figure in some regards, um, is, is reduced, and the crown is thus reduced in its power. So you don't have as much centralized authority, which is exacerbated by the continued female succession after Sibylla and Isabella. Um, so that the baronage, who had previously maybe more subservient, uh, maybe been in awe of the, of the crown, have suddenly risen to the political elite and the crown is reduced comparatively in terms so you get maybe a sort of actual sort of more um, communal and feudal uh, communal system um, of the hmm. crown having to work as an equal with its baronage rather than as in control of its baronage. I, I sort of going to disagree with you there. This, this is very rare, but I'm going to disagree with you a little bit because <laughs> if you look at the at the at the, um, the baronage of the Kingdom of Jerusalem was never that n- numerous, and the, hu- enti- the the entire function of the High Court is quite unique because you start with this elected kingship. You have a situation where the first Crusaders didn't have an absolute you know dominant r- leader. They, once they, the, the survivors, when they finally get there, choose one of their own, and then they continue to choose, and it becomes a clear elected kingship. Now, there was a pr- clear uh, bias in favor of, of, of um, a dynasty, and there was a predilection to choose the cl- closest male member of the former king, but it was still the custom, and that's why the whole usurpation of, of Guy was so, was so significant because the, by that time, 100, almost 100 years after the founding of the kingdom, the barons very much felt they had a right to veto and Guy they did not want and they are outraged that, that Sibylla goes around the high court and has him crowned without their, without their consent, the consent of parliament. I mean, we're talking about a, a, an early form of, of consent and, and joint government, and it's very clearly there in the first kingdom of Jerusalem as well. That the only thing that's somewhat, I think that you point out is different about the second kingdom is that the number of barons is reduced. So that you ha- you don't, rather than having maybe, I've forgotten the number, but it was never that many more that many more than 40 or 50 barons in the in the first kingdom by the second one maybe there's only five or six that are really important enough to have a say that John changes Evelyn the dynamics gives us four in the later later 13th century he thinks there's only okay. four barons yeah okay. yeah so what we're talking about is a change from a, a, essentially you know a kind of collective government where you have like a parliament or, or like a house of lords which is which is reigning with the king to it being a little coterie of of four four barons that's a different dynamic. But the fundamental constitution that's behind it is the same. Yeah, I, mean, I think um, it does seem that the, the kings of Jerusalem, I mean, you know, obviously they're not even really the kings of Jerusalem anymore after uh, the 13th century, except for, you know, this, this brief period during, uh, after the Sixth Crusade. Uh, the kings of, kings of Jerusalem don't loom so large in, uh, in this period as the rather iconic figures from from the first kingdom. Because that's because most of them are a bunch of foreigners who don't know what the hell they're doing. Whether it's John de Brienne or, or it's Frederick II. They don't have the interest of the kingdom at heart. These are not people who are come out of, you know, <laughs> Almeric and, and Baldwin III. I mean, all of the for the kings of the first uh, crusader, of the first kingdom of Jerusalem, were born in the kingdom. 
Right. Except sure. for Folk. Folk, but Folk will, uh, you know, gives up his kingdom and comes <laughs> out. Frederick II doesn't give up anything. He just, it's just another little appendage. Right. He's not terribly <laughs> interested in, you know, and John de Brienne, yeah, who was he? Nobody. You know, he's a, it was actually an insult to the kingdom of, of Jerusalem, as far as I'm concerned, to choose an, such a man that was so old and basically just wanted to get out of France. You know, this was not a major baron. This isn't like sending Folk d'Anjou or Hugh de Burgundy, as was talked about, with as a husband for, for Sibylla. You know, this is yeah. this is Europe. This is these these people are not men who are have have come out of the kingdom and and really care about it. And the only people who. Yes, it is the barons that care more. The, you know, even if we're going to, we're, we're sort of insulting them here, this coterie of, of small, but they at least were born and raised there and had a tradition of the kingdom yeah. and cared about it. And I mean, the medieval world had really kind of changes as we get into the 13th century too. I mean, uh, monarchies are more centralized in this period. Uh, the, the Western monarchies, you know, the King of France, the King of England did seem to kind of uh, gain uh more more of a centralized type of power and so you know the kingdom of jerusalem you know in its reduced form in this this uh later period in the 13th century seems to kind of become uh kind of a i don't know how how would you put this um a, a pawn in various political machinations of uh you know it kind of it's, it's sort of a project for for several different uh important figures from from western europe Louis the Ninth's brother Charles at one point, and of course Frederick the Second, as you mentioned. So, so you know, I, I think that might be part of it too, right, Doctor Schroeder? Kind of Absolutely. as as Europe was changing. Absolutely, you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, yes, but it, we should we shouldn't over we shouldn't exaggerate. Mm. The governments, kings are becoming more central. The governments are becoming more centralized, but it largely has to do with the personality of the king. Mm -hmm. And we're back to if you have a powerful, if had you had a powerful king in Jerusalem, my my hypothetical of earlier when he said if Richard had decided like his his great uncle had, or his great what his great grandfather had done, his great grandfather, his great -grandfather had, yeah, yeah. yeah. If he had, if he had decided, I'll be king of Jerusalem instead of king of the Angevin Empire, you would have had a very different history because he would have been mm -hmm. able to, he would have held, taken Jerusalem, hold Jerusalem, and he would have made that king strong. I mean, nobody was going to ch challenge Richard as king. He could have, he would have mm -hmm. had the barons in line because barons will follow a man they respect. You see that with Edward the Second. You see that you know, sure. they they fight against Edward the Second. They follow Richard, Edward the Third, you know, onto the ends of of the earth practically. Mm -hmm. Edward the Fourth, they would follow, you know. Henry the Sixth, they don't. It's like Henry the Fifth, they do. Henry the Fourth, you know, didn't have a chance. Uh, it wasn't there long enough. But I'm saying, you look at the, the very, very powerful barons in England. They will follow a, a strong monarch if they expect and respect the king. They will accept him as the primus under paris. If he's weak or they think he's he's incompetent or he's not doing his job, they'll revolt. That's what barons always do, and I think the, that's perfectly legitimate. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. In, in the East, there's, there's, you can't. In the West, you have actually that you have a process whereby greater centralization and the 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 confirmation of primogeniture as as the you know as a royal inheritance model um, is increasingly confirmed and becomes more firmer and more established in in the West to, uh, from the 12th century into the 13th century. Um, but you can't get that in the East because. There's no, there's nothing to centralise around in the right. same way. Yeah. The only thing you could centralise around is this particular clique, this this one cadre of, of barons, obviously, have, and that's it. And new kings are consistently sort of shipped in, but because the female succession continues for 40 years, um, and then there's a minority of, of the Hohen stuff and minority, um, that can't happen in the same way. The barons have to keep choosing and keep electing their new, uh, or you're sending people out to find a new recipient and their term is limited um, in time once their once their the heir comes of age there's no guarantee necessarily that the the king will continue I and mean, this is one of the big issues that john de brienne faced is would he continue to reign as king after his daughter had married the emperor frederick ii mm -hmm. the answer was he wanted it to be and initially it was going to be and then frederick decided it was going to be otherwise and by the time you get sort of like the 1230s you have a civil war in the kingdom right. in Cyprus. Um, ultimately, over this kind of issue, Frederick is a very 
is characterized frequently as a very sort of autocratic ruler with a very strong concept of you know his his rights and position as as the emperor and the defender of Christendom and that sort of thing, and despite obviously having wants to his 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 harem and his Muslim yeah. advisors right, but he's Go he's on. aware of it and he wants to. <laughs> obviously impose that kind of level of centralization that he's maybe used to, that he's fought for in the West um, from, from, from an early age um, on the on the Latin East. And the barons, these kind of barons that, that, who have been, you know, the Ebelins, who to be <laughs> have been at the center of politics in many regards, you know, explicitly since after 1192 and obviously very heavily since the 1170s, turn around and go like, well, no, we're not having any of it. This is our way of doing things. And, you know, you've got to follow our rules. And the and Constitution's on our side. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And the, the removal of Guy as king in 1192 in favor of Conrad has obviously set this massive precedent for that sort of, that sort of thing, is that, you know, the, the acknowledgement and the rule of the barons in, the, in, in accepting the king and determining who has the right to rule is central. And because there are no kings of considerable strength in the same way that in the 13th century as there are in the same way in the, in the 12th century, except for maybe Frederick, who's not there long enough to make, an, to make it work, um, that precedent becomes central to the nature of, the gov- of, of ruling government. Kings can't work without their barons anymore. Interesting stuff. So, it does seem like. So what we can do oh, is our next session. When the, let's say we could do something on the baronial, baronial revolt or the constitution. I also think we yeah. should do something on on the women of Jerusalem. That's what I would suggest as our next series. That would be outstanding. Yeah, we, we should do that. Well, yeah, we, we've definitely uh, gone through some interesting points here. Uh, I think I think we've we've pretty thoroughly looked at the Third Crusade and how it impacted Outremer and the Western world and the Muslim world. Um, I think kind of it seems like the final point we're sort of getting at is the Third Crusade kind of shows up uh, as everything is completely falling apart and it sort of has to to remake the Latin West and or excuse me the Latin East and and what it what it's able to remake is uh, both considerably reduced but also changed uh, so so interesting stuff um, is there anything anybody has to add to uh, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, Dr. Schroeder, absolutely. <laughs> right. I feel like I'm just waking up. I just wanted to quote uh, Claude Kunder, who was a, a um, historian of the 19th century. He mm-hmm. wrote a uh, work, The Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem. And he writes that the result of the Crusades was the Renaissance. The result of and all like the Crusades or just the third? Well, cru- he, he, well, he was talking about the Crusades. He's basically more talking about, if you like, the Crusader states. Mm-hmm. The, the 200 years of engage of, of this presence in the East, which fosters trade and cultural, intellectual, technical exchange and, you know, inspires uh, technological advancement and intellectual advancement. Um, and I just think that's something we should, I'd like to leave with our, with our viewers here, uh, listeners, that, you know, there's this tendency nowadays to think of the Crusades as something evil and dark and, and negative. But you could also look at them as the actual genesis or the roots or the cause of the Renaissance. Anything else that you would like to add to this, Dr. Donaghy? Uh, no, not really. I can, I can see that the argument of, you know, the Crusades as this catalyst um, to you know, it you know brings us back to the Renaissance much quicker than might otherwise have happened. Um, no, not really. No, that's, a, that's nothing I really have to add. Excellent. Well, as usual, it's it's wonderful to have both of you here. Uh, I think we've really hit on some some interesting points today, and this is this is really uh, exciting. This wraps up our our series of podcasts on the Third Crusade, which now we have hours and hours of discussion on the Third Crusade, available in a playlist, both on SoundCloud and YouTube. So it's pretty exciting. Um, I want to thank you both for being here. Uh, Dr. Schroeder, it's always a pleasure to have you. Thanks very much for contributing. Thank you. It's fun. Thank you very much. It is. And just to remind everybody, Dr. Schroeder uh, does uh, release some regular blog posts. She has an excellent blog, Defending Crusader Kingdoms, which deals with uh, history of the Crusades and uh, zeroes in on some interesting issues and there will be a link to that in the uh, info box uh, for this upload and dr and then the, 
Oh, and we also, I also collect those blog posts, sort of, I, I, I categorize them. In other words, the blog posts, of course, just come serially. But the website, Defender of Jerusalem, www.defenderofjerusalem.com, sort of collects all of those blogs and organizes them by topic. So it's somewhat easier. If you're looking for something specific, it may be easier to go there. Yeah. So uh, do check out uh, Dr. Schroeder online and... Uh, Dr. Donaghy, it is always great to have you here. Uh, you contribute quite a bit, and we are very appreciative of that. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much for, for having me again. Great. Well, uh, definitely want to have both of you back on in the near future. So we will uh, we will have some topics coming up on the Crusades. Uh, we do podcasts every first and fifteenth of the month. Uh, this is Real Crusades History. You can find us at www.realcrusadeshistory.com. Thank you.